can now begin. Sir Ino Odulio, the School of Humanities Coordinator for Social Involvement, will now be leading the opening phrase. Let us remember that we are always in God's holy presence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We come to you today, ever-living and loving God, to beg for your blessing and assistance for the salvation of our community and the entire creation from all forms of evil and oppression. But we cannot simply pray to you to remove injustice, for you have already given us the ability to reform the structures and processes that generate inequality. If we simply utilize our ability to aid the poor and the victims of this world. We cannot just pray to you, O God, to abolish hunger. For you have already provided us with enough resources to feed the entire world if we just use them correctly. We cannot just pray to you, O Lord, to end our misery. For you have already given us excellent minds to explore for answers and solutions to societal ills that would offer us hope if we would just use our minds for this purpose. As we hear the findings of our research this afternoon that identifies four causes of injustices, we turn to you, O God, for strength, courage, and resolve to do justice instead of just praying, to become just instead of merely wishing, so that by doing and becoming, we will be able to participate more fully in your work of recreating and liberating the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord, through the intercession of our Mother Mary and Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us all rise for the Philippine National Anthem. Ayang magiliw, pers ng silanganan, alap ng puso sa didibdib ay buhay. Lupang hinirap, duyat ka ng magiti, sa manlulupit, di ka pasisir. Sa dagat at kundok, sa siway at sa langit mong pugaw, may dilagang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal. Ang kislap ng watawat mo'y tagubay na nagniningning Ang bituin at araw na kailan pa may managitiling Lupa ng araw ng walhati pagsinta Buhay langit sa piling mo Aming ligaya ng pag may mag-aapi Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo Let us now welcome us Dr. Now welcome Jonathan Dr. Chua, Dean of the School of, the School of Humanities, Humanities, to give us welcoming, welcoming remarks. remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> All what, 10 of us? <laughs> and people watching on YouTube. Um, happy to welcome you to the third and last uh, in the series of uh, talks of the Lucid Project. Uh, social justice implications of land use change in the Philippine upland. Um, the project was uh, first presented to Dr. Vilches, our vice president for the Loyola Schools, and she thought um, that uh, it was very much in sync with two priority areas of the university, the 
uh, integral ecology and bridging cultural divide. Uh, the first lecture, and that's why we're here, the first lecture was by Dr. Andres Ignacio of the ESSC, uh, who presented how uh, geomatics technology, <laughs> GIS, uh, are used in understanding social justice questions of land use. In the second lecture by Dr. Doctor, Clarice Manuel of the Economics Department, um, uh, that one discussed the effects of uh, GM, uh, genetically modified uh, porn, uh, in the Philippines and the persistence uh, of its use. Uh, today's lecture by Pamela Duetopixano of the Philosophy Department uh, looks into the cultural drivers uh, of using GM corn uh, amongst uh, smallholder, uh, smallholder farmers in Bukidnon. Uh, in exploring the intersection of various fields of knowledge in the appreciation of what may appear to be at first simply an economic problem, uh, the poverty in the agricultural sector, uh, the series is an example of illuminating interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, the hope is that such an appreciation uh, results in a more deliberate, uh, more informed uh, policy and decision making. So uh, I'll end here <laughs> and uh, we'll have the rest of the time for the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Dr. Chua. Chua. Now we will have Dr. Dr. Andres Ignacio to give us a brief overview on the lecture series. He's the co-project lead of the LUCID project. He's director of planning and geomatics in the Institute of Environmental Science for Social Change. And he also gave the first lecture in this series. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'd just like to give a brief uh, overview of what the LUCID project is. Um, for those who have already heard this before, I ask for your patience. But um, this is a project that has already been um, uh, finished, uh, concluded this year, and uh, I will just do a quick overview of the project and its uh, objectives. I will just share my screen. Um, it, I guess it's already there. So this uh, project is really uh, resulting from a collaboration of various uh, academic institutions and research institutions in Belgium, mainly, and the Philippines. It's led by the University of Namur in Belgium, and uh, the look, that's the lead partner in Belgium, and the southern partner, as we call it, is the Environmental Science for Social Change. And we have a number of uh, partner universities as well, the Université Catholique de Louvain and uh, the Athenae de Manila University, Central Mindanao University. And BRS is the funding agency that has given support for this um, more than five year project because of the pandemic. So these are just uh, photos of the landscape in Bukidnon where PJ is actually going to talk about. And uh, we've focused on the lives of the upland communities in Bukidnon and a number of provinces as well in the Philippines. And we are basically looking for some answers to questions that have uh, cropped up in the past years of our uh, stay or uh, our uh, being present in Bukidnon. So this project has three main uh, areas of uh, intervention, mainly in Bukidnon, in Mindanao, and Isabella, and finally in Iloilo. 
So the project objectives are to provide tools to tackle the negative impacts of long-term land use change due to high impact, high input crops in the uplands. To a specific objective is to enhance well-informed decision-making um, among the actors, farmers, traders, civil society and policy makers involved in land use change due to high yield variety corn cultivation. And to promote the establishment of an equitable and environmentally responsible agriculture and therefore livelihood in the uplands. Finally, an overall objective is also to contribute to the sustainable development of upland communities and foster social justice awareness. So uh, a number of uh, results uh, have been identified in the project. And the primary one is scientific knowledge about the social drivers and risk perceptions and social justice impacts linked to high yield variety corn agriculture in the uplands is gained. Academic capacities in the field of social justice and social sustainability are increased. Scientific-based information on the drivers, social and environmental impacts caused by high yield variety corn agriculture in the uplands is produced and used for awareness raising. And finally, resources are used efficiently and effectively. That's more of an internal project uh, result. So the activities included the documentation of land use changes attributed to uh, HYV corn cultivation using gematics technology. And this is the uh, initial talk that I gave where we had land cover updates using Sentinel-2 uh, satellite imagery in Bukidnon, Isabela and Iloilo provinces. And to analyze intertemporal dynamics of land use transformation and associated household decision-making in terms of the drivers and risk perceptions using development economics tools and methods. And this is uh, more in relation to the second talk that was given by Clarice Manuel a number of weeks ago. Here we wanted to, uh, we conducted socioeconomic surveys uh, of upland corn farmers in Bukidnon specifically. And these are uh, some of the youth that took part in that uh, survey, they, uh, they were upland youth, uh, indigenous mostly, and they helped uh, our academics conduct the surveys to the small uh, corn farmers. And as a continuation to upgrade gematics capacities applied in the field of social sciences using state-of-the-art remote sensing technology, where he had an uh, internship uh, in uh, the Catholic University of Louvain. And as to strengthen research capacity in development economics and philosophy of social justice in the Philippine universities. So we are, uh, here we have PJ, our current speaker, and uh, Clarice Manuel, who were, are current, currently still doing their uh, uh, research uh, and PhDs in uh, their specific fields. So we had a PhD in development economics and a PhD in philosophy where PJ is uh, involved. Finally, organizing field-based courses on sustainable human development for business schools. So here we have uh, some photos of the engagements that we've had in the last uh, years of the project, five years, uh, more than five years. And uh, we wanted to assess the farmer's well being, uh, well being related to agricultural practices through participative workshops and qualitative field investigation using capability approach indicators. This uh, relates more to PJ's uh, research and to optimize academic dissemination of evidence-based research findings and recommendations, and to conduct aware ra awareness raising activities, targeting actors driving land use change. So we had a number of activities, field-based activities, gathering uh, a wide uh, group of um, stakeholders, 
to understand what is actually going on in the field in relation to upland corn farming. Uh, a lot of our national institutions, actually, government institutions and academic institutions are not really aware of uh, the gravity of the situation in terms of the problems that the farmers uh, uh, experience. So here are some of the meetings that we had in the field in uh, Bendum, actually, that was uh, in Eastern Bukidnon. And uh, these are very rich uh, exchanges uh, among uh, NGO uh, representatives, government, academe, uh, and other uh, uh, participants. And then we had the final conference uh, of the project uh, just last year. Here are some of the photos uh, of that uh, engagement. So um, thank you for bearing with that. Uh, these are uh, these are just uh, some of the uh, highlights of the project. And uh, as, a, as a, I will segue to some um, activity, uh, some interviews, uh, a video that we produced uh, at the end of the project, uh, looking at uh, trying to communicate the, the struggles of our farmers uh, in the uplands, specifically in Bukidnon, and uh, trying to understand uh, the context uh, of where they are. This is a, uh, these are two videos where, uh, that actually comprise a, a longer video, it's a bit too long, but uh, we have uh, uh, two shorter versions that we'll be presenting uh, here. Um, PJ, if you can just play them. And this is uh, really hopefully gives people uh, an understanding, uh, a better context of where PJ will be coming from in terms of her talk. Thank you. In the Philippines, rising demand for genetically modified corn for animal meat has changed the odds with profound impacts on the socioeconomic dynamics of upland indigenous communities. Low maintenance, high yielding varieties of corn attracted a lot of smallholder upland farmers, the poorest in the agriculture sector, because of the promise of high returns despite the risks that come with it. We've been here in this part of Bukid Non, in the upper Pulangi area of Malay Malay City for more than 30 years. We noticed a lot of changes in the landscape, particularly the expansion of corn in this part of the uplands of Bukid Non. And we also noticed and heard that there are a lot of difficulties of the smallholder farmers here. What we decided was to craft a research project that would look into the socio-economic conditions of the smallholder farmers who are planting corn, not just here in Bukidnon, but also in other major corn-producing provinces in the country, such as Isabela and Iloilo. 
through the Lucid Project, we were able to come together from various disciplines to try to collectively understand what is going on in relation to this particular issue that is present in our corn industry. Lahi ragin sa una, kung karon, akong na tanaw sa karon, gabi na ka daghan nga mga tahilahe nga kuan, makita nato sa atong mga palibot kay sa una, sa adamang po ang yuta nga tamnan, tambo, di na kinanglag abono. Daling niya sa 60 o 70, wala pa'y abono dere. Nagumang mga tao, tambok ang tanong, Maes o unsa niya ng mga tanong, tambok. Pero pag abot sa 70, basta na sa 70, pataas. So nanay abono. Nahitabo ang nanay abono kay nag-upir ang bangko nga makalun ang mga tao. 10% ang kuang kada isa ka sako, kada bulan 10% yun siya. Karun na dili na sir, di na may mga utang kay kuan mahal man kaayos gibaligya na mo among maumaong tabo pay among gibayad kay kun mangita mangutang gud ka sa tindahan pag mudyo na is kuan na dako na ang iyang interes mo patong mo patong mo patong mo ragyud na sir mo ragyud na sige bali bali makaharbis ang sobra bajiton pay guan estudyante o pagkaon so kung imo lang yung kuano na siya misuran ba jud ka kay sempre ang imuhang sinima na makuaan gito dito sa imuhang sa imuhang gi pinanso kinanglan ka pasun gini mo imong sinima nang makabayad ka magpilyor na gid na pilyor mi wala gid mi na bilin utang ang nabilin the farmers are still producing worldwide 80% of the food we eat but it's as if the corporates through their food fillers and everything else Yeah, dominate food production. The farmers are closest to the poorest people. And actually, you see how many of the poor people's needs, the old, the children that are there, how they are fed, out of the sharing that's there, that doesn't get recorded in the economy. We're at a transition at this day, and we're seeing their greatest vulnerability. Walo kabuk akong anak, pwede rato sila nga mo'y magtanom, mo'y mag-abuno, mo'y maglampa. Pero ang diligid ni Makaya karun ang abuno o ang binhi. Kaya grabe na mahala. Mahal ang abuno, mahal ang mais. Pero ang amang agian ka ng karsada o paingan sa amang trabahuan. Misod ka ayaw di haragid sa amang kuan ka ng halin sa kibali mais na maka. Baligya na mo di haragid sa anang bayad ra sa hawo. Dili po na akong makwinta o pilay akong gasto o pilay po akong abot o pilay po akong ganun siya. Sige naman kong tanong, pero ano ay... Science is playing a role in policy again. We cannot deny climate change. And people are recognizing this because they are now understanding the link with employment, the link with work. That affects everyone. If we can get over this divisive politics, we have a potential for coherence in society and we have a potential for care. These are where the changes are coming. Sa ako alam, maganda ko o kabalhinan para sa gudanin mo kanap itaw mga isda sa pulangi wala na dilit, halos dilit na makaot. O sa hay, ma landslide among area, mauna siya ma pilyor me o sa hay nagan lagi mga kwan nga mo abot inlo lapon sa luwa na ikahoy kayo nga kwan sunod 
Mak orang pun anggi sok sok kanan terbau. Ewa mai lain ke peinan. Nabi Nasa yuta din hega kinanglan sok organik ke bisan usaha ona tu abono minus ke ang kampuk sayu tak nah. Oh na na e na ni kena ko na kena lili ma ko ansa tong kenyahan maka imong nang sakit-sakit atong komunidad sa atong lawas sa daghanan ako may kaw sa atong na gamit kadaot na sa una kayo may mga sakit sa una sa mga tigulang mga matay na lang sila nga tungod nga kanang diha na gisa ila nang ilang nang edad na pero kanang mga sakit-sakit nga pareha karon nga kadaghan ang maka hospital nga klase-klase nga sakit wala gid sa una kani guru kay nga ni maniha tu ang mga katigulangan wala may wala pero nga buhi ba sila nga tigu na kan nga taas nga edad sila nga mga bata pa na na nay mga sakit mao kana nga dili bag-o naman nga pamaagi nga nasunod bag-o naman ang nakita nga kana What we're seeing are limitations in market are emerging. Now that's what people are paying attention to. There is no tank big enough that you can build in the city for the water you want, yeah, for the whole year's sustainable water supply. You have to depend on the natural water tanks in the mountains that the indigenous know how to deal with. So we're learning from this systems failure, the possibility of a systems shift of how we think and how we're willing to act. Nakagi ko o pilyor, pilyor sa tungod sa init, pilyor sa tungod sa ilaga, pilyor sa tungod sa bikan sa pagturok sa mais, bifan ibot, muna nag-usa na sila. O pilyor po sa presyo kay agi na po o kilo sa mais, 3 pesos. Kana gamay ni Piperin sa Ana, malugi na yun kay Ana, mga... Di gina malik ya kaya ang panahon di may magpareha. Mapilyor ang anong uma, balik ragya po may sa uno mo. Sa pamaagi kaya na ito kinihonglos, kinabangay, taman ras paniod to. Ito paniod to ang maibita, nga matabang, pero walay suhol. O muna yung pamaagi kaya na ito. O karon, ana-ana di na pwede nga dili maghahatay si 300-400 kada adlaw. Lahi na karun. Nawala na siya karun kaya karun nga panahon. Umikan siguro sa buwan. Na siguro, kanina siguro mga usahay ang kanimang darbo usahay. Tao. Na siya kwarta. Hindi lang yung mursia. Pag naanad na ba ang tao ng suhulan? May we now call on Ma'am Pamela Joy Mariano Capistrano to give us her presentation entitled Exploring the Concept of Structural Injustice Through the System of Smallholder Corn Farming in Upper Pulang. I got disconnected from the Zoom, but so I don't know if I'll be able to share my my slides with the. Oh no, I didn't. I can share my slides. Yes, child. Wait a minute. Wait. Okay. Sorry. I was slightly distracted by the presence of Ethan. Let's just move that to this desktop. Sorry. Let me just share this to the to the stream. Sorry for the people here. There's more people on the stream, I think. Fingers crossed. Okay. Okay, 
Okay, um, good evening again to everyone here and online. Um, thank you for being here today. I know it's the end of the semester, so people are busy and tired and having a lot of other things to be at. Um, and I hope to share um, a significant portion of the research that I did as part of the Lucid project. And Dr. Ignacio has also already talked to you about the Lucid project, so I won't talk too much about that. So the title of my lecture today, An Exploration of Structural Injustice Through the System of Smallholder Corn Farming in the Upper Pulani is a bit of a mouthful, but I'll try to make the rest of it as digestible as I can. So I'll just cover four main points in today's presentation. <laughs> Okay. okay, so the first one is uh, basically it's, um, explaining further my research context and particularly um, how I viewed my role in the context of the Bigger Lucid project and offering a brief answer to the question that I've actually received a few times, which is, how is your work philosophy? And ostensibly a lot of people would say that, you know, this sounds more like the realm of anthropology or sociology. The second point today I will briefly touch on is the idea of structural injustice and its relationship to the capability approach. So for those not familiar with it, um, the capability approach is an interdisciplinary approach to human development, most identified with the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen and the philosopher Martha Nussbaum. And I want to explain why these two concepts, <laughs> the concept of structural injustice and its relationship to the approach are some things that I want to develop further, which I think will be for the benefit of the capability approach and its applications. The third point will summarize some of my key observations and analyses based on my field research and identify possible implications into the nature of particular structural injustices that enable the perpetuation of the system of genetically modified corn farming not only in Bukid Non, but in the rest of the country as well. And end my presentation by briefly talking about the contributions and implications of these observations to our understanding of structural injustice as a concept and the possibility of real change and how the capability approach can use these insights. So first, my research point. My research context, my research was obviously done as part of the Lucid project, but within my project, I viewed my work as a way of better understanding the human impact of the continued cultivation of genetically modified corn in the upper Pulangi watershed in northeastern and eastern Bukidnon, as well as to understand why these practices persist despite the clear disadvantages for the farmers and all of the farmers and even some of the small scale lenders, the fi the, who I will call trader financiers, recognize this. So even the people who gave them loans knew that it was disadvantageous for farmers. At the same time, my research is also my PhD project for a degree in political philosophy. And that conceptual part of that thesis consists of thinking about structural injustice in relation to the capability approach and its applications. And as I've mentioned, the capability approach is a, an approach in to human development, and it's become really popular in the last 30 years. And it's often seen as a viable alternative to uh, approaches to development that are too economistic or too focused on the distribution of goods or on the, the increase of gross national product at the expense of actual human lives. Curiously, however, despite its widespread application in analyzing actual situations of injustice, there's not a lot of conceptualization within the capability approach itself of how the approach can be used as an analytical tool to understand structural injustices, how specific social structures are unjust, and for whom they are unjust. And my work is part of a larger effort to, to fill that gap. For me, having been trained by philosophers like Padre Roque Furiols, who emphasized how philosophy begins with, reflects on, and clarifies, and always returns to lived experience. 
My project has always been clearly philosophical from the start. The project of accompanying and working alongside farmers, agricultural middlemen, and development practitioners, listening to them recount their experiences, reflecting on and integrating their different points of view to better understand their shared horizon, articulating their unvoiced assumptions. In view of expanding that horizon, deepening our understanding, informing action, and informing practice. This is the work of philosophy in praxis and as praxis. One part of this work of philosophy as deepening understanding, reflection, and integration is to do with the idea of structural injustice. As I just mentioned, despite the capability approaches popular use in the analysis of concrete situations of deprivation, oppression, and injustice, there has not been a lot of conceptual development of how the approach can be used to analyze the background context of these injustices, why and how unjust social structures and practices are formed, and even more importantly, how these persist and are perpetuated despite their obvious negative effects. Though Amartya Sen's work has often been interpreted as being within the bigger family of liberal rights-based theories, his work, The Idea of Justice, can be read as a critique of these theories. One, idea, one area of his critique is the dominance of what John Rawls has described as ideal theory. That is, the approach to justice that is primarily, con primarily concerned with formulating what is a just society and how such a society can be achieved in the real world is really just a secondary and non-ideal task. In contrast, Sen describes his work as realization-focused and comparative, less concerned about conceptualizing what justice is, but rather with understanding concrete injustices in view of addressing and eliminating them. This implies an understanding of injustice as capability deprivation which within the capability approach is understood as the constraints on human well-being and the constraints on human agency. One aspect of this that Sen raises but does not elaborate on in great detail is the mutual relationship between individual agents' capabilities and the social milieu of these agents. One cannot be properly understood without the other. This is a relationship that can be further described through the help of social theory. And I do that in my broader PhD thesis through the work of Sally Haslanger and her social ontology, where she tries to articulate the relationships between individuals and the resources that they access, the social practices that try to organize um, access to those resources, and how these practices evolve into social structures. I also think that this Emphasis in the capability approach that Sen raises, that emphasis on the relation between the individual and the social, is a corrective to approaches to justice that focus exclusively on individual agents, like Nozick's libertarianism, or on formal institutions alone, as what a lot of um, theorists and policy um, advocates have taken after roles, which have focused exclusively on policy making and working with states or interstate institutions. I wish I could discuss more here, but for our purposes today, this mutuality between individual agents and social relations gives us a key into understanding the concept of structural injustice, to which I shall now turn. For my research, I use this working definition of structural injustice from the philosopher Iris Marion Young which is able to articulate further the two-way relationship between individual agents, capabilities, and social relations, and how injustice can arise within these relations. In her posthumously published book, Responsibility for Justice, Young gives us the following definition. Structural injustice exists when social processes put large groups of persons under systematic threat of domination and deprivation of the means to develop and exercise their capacities, at the same time that these processes enable others to dominate or to have a wide range of opportunities for developing and exercising capabilities available to them. 
Structural injustice is distinct from the wrongful action of an individual agent or the repressive policies of a state. Structural injustice occurs as a consequence of many individuals and institutions acting to pursue their particular goals and interests, for the most part within the limits of accepted rules and norms. I kept this working definition of structural injustice in the background as I began my field research and my interpretation of the data that the economics team obtained, trying to see how much this working definition captured the realities on the ground in the upper pula. To do justice to this comparison between this working definition and the realities on the ground, one of the things that I wanted to do was to try to construct a fuller picture of the social structure of corn farming in the area. To do this, I wanted to get as many perspectives as possible from as many different agents as possible. I also tried to be reflective about my own position as a researcher who is a relative outsider in the area and use different approaches to getting to know the different people. As you can see at, with this timeline on screen, um, it was a bit difficult for me to find a way to access the trader financiers as compared to um, farmers. I couldn't use the same channels that I had used to approach farmers, which was through ESSC, which is, I guess, a broadly a civil society organization. And I had to get creative and think of approach. And I realized that a lot of these trader financiers are socially and economically influential members of the community. And with a knowledge of local culture, if you're influential in the community, a lot of times, if you're Catholic, you will give to your local parish. So it happened that the local parish priest was a Jesuit. And I asked the parish priest, do you know any of these people who are trader financiers? And voila, I was able to get respondents for my interviews. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to do follow-up interviews with these trader financiers due to the pandemic. But nonetheless, it was such a it was a very illuminating, illuminating experience. Throughout this whole process of the field research, uh, I had these two oops, I had these two questions at heart. First, does corn farming in the Upper Pulangi require other non-economic forms of capital to be profitable? And second, what is or are the social relationships and social processes that enable or, pet or perpetuate this situation, despite the very real disadvantages for farmers? In my interviews, so many of these smallholder farmers recognize how they are really vulnerable and how it's such a risky farm to crop and how they've experienced injustice. But many of them still continue to farm this crop. So what are my tentative answers to these two questions? Well, aside from the ease of farming, which is enabled by the use of glyphosate, the herbicide, which has reduced the amount of physical labor, because prior to glyphosate, corn was extremely labor intensive to farm. You had to weed the corn every day. And if you had like more than a hectare to, to farm, that's extremely intense labor. So with glyphosate, you just have to spray a couple of times throughout the planting season. Another significant factor that promotes the cultivating, the continued cultivation of corn are really the access to what Pierre Bourdieu would call economic, social, and cultural capital. And all of these things, if you are a smallholder farmer who has like a hectare of land or two hectares of land, are things that you can only access through these trader financiers. With that kind of size of, of plot of land, you won't be able to get a bank loan to finance your farming. You'll have to go through private financing. You go to the local trader who sells the seeds and the chemical inputs and ask for a loan. And it seems that um, a lot of times also, this is their only connection as well to the technical support required for farming these crops. Um, and this realization that the trader financiers are the gatekeepers of these different forms of capital, the economic, social, and cultural capital, um, first came to me during an interview with a trader financier. And in the middle of that interview, 
he got a call from a seed company sales agent who asked him, like, sorry to interrupt you, but can you, can you come to a farmer's meeting? What is a farmer's meeting? A farmer's meeting is really a marketing event organized by the seed brand at demonstration farms after the harvest of the, the corn. And they gather the farmers from the vicinity, the local barangay, and they show off the yield of the corn to, to get these farmers to buy that brand of corn. And during that meeting, when one farmer asked about the schedule of applying herbicides and fertilizers, the sales agent answered, just follow farmer's practice. Later on, I had learned from the sales agent himself, because <laughs> I had lunch with him. He was running out of things to say to the farmers, and that's why he had called the trader, because his um, invited guest did not arrive, like his, um, his resource speaker <laughs> did not arrive to the farmer's meeting. So he called the trader instead. What's the connection of the trader to the demo farm? The demonstration farm was actually on the um, farmland that was owned by this trader financier. Um, so in the account of the sales agent that I had lunch with, he was a long-time sales agent for the parent company of the seed company. <laughs> and that when the parent conglomerate had acquired the seed company, he had been given that sales account. Before that, he was selling something totally different. I think pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and then he said, I know nothing about farming. That's why I called um, this trader, because at least he knows more about farming than I do. What I know about is hitting sales targets. Also present at that farmer's meeting was a retired agronomist. And he had a lot of things to say. He had opinions when the sales agent left. And he bemoaned the dearth of information that farmers receive about the seeds that they purchase. The advice, he says, to follow farmers' practice is a symptom of what he thinks is a bigger problem. As an agronomist, and he had worked um, in agrochemical companies for most, most of his career, he learned that different hybrid corn seed brands have different nutritional requirements. But none of that information is made accessible to the farmers neither by seed companies nor by the, Fili the Philippine government's agricultural technicians. In theory, this information is provided to farmers by the agricultural technicians from the Department of Agriculture, but is not provided to them in Bukidnon. It seems to be the case in other parts of the Philippines and other provinces and regions, though. Instead, their resources for this knowledge, this cultural um, capital, is at best the trader financier from whom they buy the seeds. Hosting these demo farms is also another manifestation of economic, social, and cultural capital. The seed companies monitor these demonstration farms closely. They send research teams and agricultural teams regularly to take samples and advise the owner of the demonstration farm regarding the proper planting techniques for the seeds and when to apply the chemical inputs, the herb when to apply the herbicides, how much, when to apply pesticides, and when to apply fertilizers for optimal crop growth. This landowner, in turn, is able to use the optimal schedule of application on their other non-demonstration farms and thus harvests and earns more than the neighboring small farmers who don't have the benefit of this information. Interestingly, all the people I interviewed who had demonstration farms were trader financiers. What's more, if even though a farmer may be interested in shifting to other cash crops or to organic farming and intercropping practices, and about one third of the farmers I interviewed express this desire explicitly, making the shift is difficult because there are no broader systems supporting them. Shifting to a different crop still requires capital, and organically farmed produce is bought at the same price as conventionally farmed produce by traders in Bukidnon. It's, a diff it's obviously in other provinces it's different, just next door to Bukidnon in Davao, there is a premium that's put on organically farmed produce, but that's not the case in Bukidnon just yet. 
There has also been an indigenous crop in high demand in the market that farmers, farmers are starting to return to cultivating, which is adlai, and adlai is really native to that region. But there are no policy directives from local governments to support this shift despite farmers' desires. And they have to be the ones but to find the buyers for the adlai. Unlike if they buy, if they farm corn, the traders from whom they, they bought the seeds are either themselves the buyers of corn or have connections to buyers. And these buyers can come right to their farm and truck out these corn cargs for them. Um, and instead of having local government policies to support their desire to shift to other crops, the opposite is the case. Um, shortly after my interviews in 2020, one of the municipalities in the area began calling itself the corn capital of Bukidnon, actively promoting the expansion of corn cultivation, and they even built this lovely monument to corn in this slide that you can see. It remains to be seen, however, how much of this is a PR campaign for the local government, the mayor having been formerly a large corn trader in the area, and how much of this is actually shown through technical support for farmers on the ground. In the system, working for cash is taken for granted. Financing through the local trader financier seems the easiest way to access capital because of their relationships already established, affiliation and patronage. And there's no need to find buyers for one's crop because the farm traders can come to you. Shifting to another crop like, like Adlai is a lot harder because you have to find your own capital, you have to find your own labor, find your own buyers, and find your own transportation and they have to go at it virtually alone. So, in the social structure I have described, who has the power? Whose interests are prioritized? And on the service, it may seem that the trader financiers have the power as the gatekeepers of economic, cultural, and social capital for, for the farmers. Yet, the stop here conceals the bigger interests who are being prioritized that is of the corporations who sell the seeds and the chemical inputs. Going back to the definition of structural injustice from Iris Marion Young, it's important to emphasize how none of the trader financiers nor the corporations are doing things that are illegal. They are just pursuing profits with the accepted norm and the accepted goal for any business. Yet as a consequence of this pursuit of profit, they are cultivating and perpetuating injustice to farmers. Interestingly, um, as part of the Lucid project, we also tried to pilot a field course for MBA students for AGSB, the, uh, the Ateneo Graduate School of Business. And one of the MBA students that um, went on one of the pilot courses was formerly an employee of a seed company. And she told us about the practices from inside and that was really uh, serendipitous because she really confirmed a lot of my suspicions because why would all of these trader financiers push farmers to farm more corn when they themselves saw that it was disadvantageous and risky for farmers? Even the farmers themselves knew that it was risky for them. And a lot of it was they were being incentivized by the seed companies themselves. They would get um, bonuses or um, cuts, or they would like they would have sales targets, and if they met those targets, they would get some sort of perk. Um, rumor has it, but it was not confirmed by the financial that I had interviewed. But one rumor that was going around was that one successful local financier was able to go on like a, a junket to Japan, like a touristy, ostensibly to visit the the company's laboratories there in Japan, because it was a Japanese um, agro-industrial company. But I mean, if you think about the kind of social context and the kind of clout and social, social influence that, that can give to people within small communities like this, it really, it really feels like all, a lot of the corporate interests are using these relations that already exist in, in these communities to further their own profit motive at the expense of farmers. 
And that brings me back to the philosophical reflection on this reality. What are the implications for the capability approach and for social action? And one of the things that, that really I find challenging about structural injustice is the challenge of responsibility for, for structural injustice. Because unlike um, situations where there is a clear liability, like a clear corporate liability or a clear individual liability, there's no clear individual or clear corporate liability. The responsibility is diffused across the social relationships. Because at every stage of this, re of, of this social structure, people can just say, we're acting according to norms and we're not doing anything illegal. By traders offering small-scale lending to these small farmers, they're not doing anything illegal. They're acting within these norms. By um, corporations offering sales um, bonuses for hitting or exceeding sales targets to traders, they're not doing anything illegal. And they're acting within the norms of their industry. So it's hard to find somebody that you can really say, no, you're the one who's liable for the kinds of injustices the small-scale farmers are experiencing. But at the same time, if we look at how social structures are formed, we also see that it's within these social structures that the possi possibility of change lies. I mentioned very briefly earlier Sally Haslanger's um, social ontology, where she talks about how social practices are the result of individuals' attempts to organize their community's access to resources, and how these practices eventually grow into social structures. It's much more complicated than that, but I, I will leave you, I will hyper simplify to that. And depending on your position in that social structure, you may have lesser or greater power within those practices. But nonetheless, people can change these practices. How? Either by changing the practices themselves, by changing the resources that are valued, or changing their position in that structure. And one of the things that I find very um, interesting and hopeful, at least for the upper Pulani, is the possibility of organizing. So I, one of my, one of my um, co-supervisors in Belgium is a, um, an anthropologist of agriculture. And she was asking me in French, um, wala, bang, wala bang farmers organizations dyan? And I said, you know what? Wala. There's no, there are no farmers organizations in this particular area. And partly because a lot of the communities in this area are either indigenous people or migrants to the area who come from lowland areas. And for a long time, I think there, there was a chilling effect that red tagging had on organizing that Especially, I think it was also reflected in how it was difficult for me to find um, access to trader financiers because I was working with an NGO and NGOs get red tagged in this country. So um, even if it was a Jesuit affiliated NGO. So one of the things that, that gives me hope is that within the indigenous communities, they themselves have started thinking about organizing within their communities to look at alternatives and find, find ways of moving out of the social structure of corn farming. And I think that, 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 that gives us an insight also into that second point, how the capability approach can be used to help answer background questions. I think a lot, a lot of the applications of the capability approach in the present have really focused on things like um, capability assessment and trying to see, okay, what are the capabilities that people have, have access to, is there inequality in these, in these access? And that's great, it's really helpful. But we can also move beyond into 
the bigger questions like why why do people have unequal access to these capabilities what are the social structures that lead to these inequalities of access and that's where i hope the end of my phd thesis if not the end of this talk will lead to and I am at 29 minutes and 30 seconds, so that's where I will end for this evening. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions and comments either now or um, through my email or my social media handles on screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am EJ. Um, at this point, we can open the floor for some questions. We'll also, also be checking, checking the stream if there are questions there. You can just raise your hand if you have questions. PJ, thank you for the presentation. I'm really interested in your dissertation. I look forward to reading it when it's done. Um, I, have, I, have, I have two questions. One is just empirical, one is conceptual. You say empirical, I'm curious about the decision of the farmers to adopt more modern agricultural techniques. What I'm getting for, from you, and this is just to confirm, is that you're talking about small owner cultivators, so they own their own land, and then the corporates sold the idea of more modern farming to them. Yeah, um, more or less. Well, it's slightly, slightly complicated because some of these lands that are cultivated in the area where I did my research are part of ancestral domains. So it's not really like individual, so it's more collective, but they do just cultivate small um, areas. And they're also marginal lands. So most of these areas are slopes of uh, like 15 degrees or higher, up to 45 degrees. Um, because the valleys and plain areas are devoted for more profitable things like rice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and, and based on some of the videos, I think parang we trace this back all the way to Green Revolution 70s. Yes. Yun yung origins niya. Yeah, and um, specifically uh, in the area, the economics team tried to do a, a study also of the when they first encountered high yield variety corn and this was probably in the late 80s or early 90s and then as soon as gm corn was approved to, for use in the philippines it already reached them because the center of gm corn at the time was cotabato and then it was very near <laughs> so so they've actually shifted to either genetically modified corn, the branded ones, or the, um, I've tried to find the right term for it, the hybridized um, corn, which is called Sigi Sigi, and corn, corn companies, the, the seed companies will call it pirated versions of the corn because they, have a patent on the genes that are supposed to be resistant to glyphosate. But, well, <laughs> that's, that's debatable, <laughs> I think, whether that patent is legitimate or not. Yeah. Salamat. Kasi interesting yung dynamic nung, kasi may decision rin yung farmers or farmer groups dito, di ba? So that's also an interesting dynamic. Yeah. And not, it's not just a landlord making the decision for the farmer, pero may agency then to some extent. Yes. No? Mm -mm. Yung conceptual question, yung si Amar Chasen, di ba parang, he is accused of being a liberal, um, I've heard so many Marxist criticisms about yes. Sen, that he talks, he, doesn't, he talks about poverty, doesn't talk about causes. Yeah. Um, is that a fair assessment of Sen? And is, or is your dissertation, yun nga, going where Sen doesn't really go? Um, it tries to go where Sen doesn't really go, but says that it's a legitimate way of reading his text. Like, it's easy. I think it's very easy and um, to read Sen as liberal. 
I think you have to read between uh, you have to like read into so much else of what he talks about. I think like if you read his Indian his references to Indian philosophy, and he even has a series of essays um, that was published in India and then collected in English and published here is just as like a collection of essays that people think of as throwaway. And I find when I read that I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> this guy is not really liberal. And 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 I. I think, I don't know, and this is me, I don't know if I'll put this in my, my dissertation yet, but I really feel like so many of his commentators have ignored the justice as nyaya distinction that he makes. And this is something that he draws from classical Indian philosophy. And it's not even like mainstream classical Indian philosophy, it's like Indian jurisprudence. <laughs> Whoa. It's, it's like so specific. Medyo nakakainis si Martisen, kasi yung buhay niya parang, ah, you were a child and your grandfather was an in, a, a scholar of ancient Sanskrit? Uy, set. <laughs> nakakainis. Pero, and I think that this idea of justice as nyaya gives us a way of understanding his approach to social change. Because I really talk about grounded, like a grounded understanding of justice. And we, when he talks about it, I don't know why he never really brings it up, but it really sounds like social theory, <laughs> critical social theory, even more precisely. Like, yeah, it, it, I find that it, it's more, it's closer to like feminist critical social theory, um, and a lot of like the the social theory that's more contemporary. Not to go to, not like. Um, Maybe not Marcuse, <laughs> but like a lot of the, the more contemporary social theorists who are, who are kind of trying to move away from Habermas. Yeah. So, yun. I, I hope that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, any more questions? There's actually a question in the stream from oh, Doc Rowie Palacios. Oh, oh. Um, and there's also a... A question from the child, but yes. <laughs> um, so Dr. Crowey asks, what implications can you see for ecological or environmental education, especially in the way that our responsibility for the environment is framed? Okay, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, one of the implications, I think, of this, of this way of approaching structural injustice, and it's really an attempt to to have like a more integrative vision of all of these different factors. Amartya Sen will call them conversion factors. The factors that influence individuals' ability to convert resources into capability. <laughs> but um, it's really a kind of... Uh, an attempt to try to understand the complexity of relations and how you can't really separate material reality from our social interpretation of reality and what's valuable in material reality. Is it who said that corn was valuable? I mean, corn used to be like a wild um, crop and then people started cultivating it because they realized that it was valuable. And that in many ways, a lot of our current social structures, so to think about it ecologically then, a lot of our current social structures have really come from our collective and individual decisions of how we value our physical environment and how we relate to that physical environment on the basis of how we value it. So... It's also an examination of what are the values that we hold as individuals and as collectives in relation to the world that we inhabit. I hope that answers your question, Rui, online. All right. Um, any more questions? Mika, do you have a question? <laughs> No. <laughs> Just raise action. your hand. Yes. Any questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> 
Halo major si Ata tuh. <laughs> If there are no other questions, um, thank you very much for coming today and uh, um, thank you for supporting our research project and please again if you have um, any other questions you can always contact me through my social media handles. Yeah, um, before we end, we'd like to thank the following. The Institute of Environmental Science for Social Change, the Department of Economics, the Department of Philosophy, the Office of the Dean, School of Humanities, the technical support provided by the CFNO and the UMCO, our previous lecturers, Dr. Andres Ignacio and Clarice Colleen Manuel, and of course the attendees. Um, before we leave, there are refreshments and snacks that you can go, that you can try. That's all. That's all. Thank you very, very much, much for, for attending. attending. <laughs>